thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Barbara. Good afternoon to all of you. I can um, only judge by the presence in the uh, auditorium that it has got to be a slow week uh, otherwise on campus and in town. Um, uh, that's one way to introduce me. I, I kind of like that. Um, uh, another way would be uh, to imagine sort of a, a pictorial representation of my career. If you, if you could conceive of um, every major policy setback and disaster to American interests <laughs> in the broader Middle East for the last 30 years, if you could conceive those as a set of photographs, uh, I would be in every one of them, <laughs> second row, third from the left. It's, uh, um, it, it is, uh, it's great to be back on campus and here at the, uh, the Woodrow Wilson School. As Barbara noted, I was a mid-career fellow uh, back in the dawn of time. Uh, I have had the opportunity to visit uh, a number of seminars this week, and I actually think uh, up to now I may have attended more classes here at Woodrow Wilson on this trip than I, I did in 1984-85. Um, uh, let's see, have we lost our, we've lost our map. Okay, I'm sure you all memorized it. Um, um, and this being Princeton, you had no need to do so because you have a, a full grasp of the uh, geography of the broader Middle East. Uh, uh, we, we, we Americans are a great people, uh, without question, but we do have um, uh, some limitations. We uh, tend to be uh, geographically challenged. Um, uh, we tend to be somewhat ahistorical, uh, and we tend to be impatient. Um, uh, and those latter two attributes, I, I would argue, um, have made uh, always complicated endeavors in uh, the broader Middle East, um, perhaps that much more complicated. Um, it, it is a challenging region, and the challenge starts simply by trying to define it. I mean, what do we mean when we talk about the Middle East? Um, um, and that's uh, in, in a part why I wanted to have a map in front of us. Uh, there is no common uh, uh, definition. Within the United States government, the, um, the State Department defines um, uh, the Middle East one way. Uh, the uh, Department of Defense uh, defines it yet another way. Uh, and the combatant commands define it a third way. Um, um, so I have no hesitation in advancing my own definition. Uh, uh, the, the region that I'll be addressing extends from Morocco uh, in the west uh, through the Arab world, uh, Iran, also to include Afghanistan and Pakistan. Uh, uh, why do I define it that way? Because I've served in all those places. Uh, 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 ah, there we are. Okay. Um, and I indeed on this map, um, we've truncated a bit. Um, uh, but I would very much extend it uh, west through North Africa to the, um, uh, to the Atlantic Ocean. Um, uh, but I, I think there is a, uh, a more serious reason for that as well. Uh, the countries, the region I've described, I, I think uh, carries some systemic characteristics. Uh, um, and we help ourselves in thinking in terms that apply uh, uh, to this broader region. Uh, in the case of current events, um, I think it's important to bear in mind that um, that, in many respects, is how some of our most determined adversaries um, define it. Um, Al-Qaeda, in particular, um, engaged uh, against us on the uh, Pakistan-Afghanistan border, as well as in Iraq uh, and in other parts of the, uh, the Arab world. Uh, they see a systemic coherence here, um, and we would do well, I think, to um, also think in those terms uh, uh, where, it is, where it is relevant. So what are some of those characteristics uh, that, um, uh, that apply to our current consideration of this region? Uh, uh, one of them 
and perhaps the most important, I would, su I would suggest, is that uh, the, the Middle East is possibly the most interpenetrated major region of the world vis-a-vis -vis the West. Uh, uh, there is a millennial history of uh, interaction between the Middle East uh, and the West. Uh, it goes back to the dawn of Islam, um, the Muslim conquest, the expansion into what is now Spain and France, um, uh, through the Crusades, uh, through the era of the Ottoman Empire, um, that found the Ottomans at the gates of Vienna and at different stages um, the forces of the West at the gates of Istanbul. Um, and as this suggests, um, that interaction has uh, more often than not um, been a violent one uh, and particularly in uh, recent time uh, that violence has occurred on the lands of the Middle East and not of the West. Um, uh, again, just uh, not to belabor you too much with lessons of history, uh, if you pick a starting date, say, for the, the modern era of East-West interaction, uh, uh, one date you can choose is 1798. Um, uh, 1798 is when uh, Napoleon showed up in Egypt. Uh, uh, most Americans have no idea that Napoleon was ever in Egypt. He needed some way to fill up time between engagements in Europe. Um, and he wasn't there very long. Uh, but that, again, in, in the, uh, the decline of the, uh, the Ottoman Empire, uh, led to an era in which we saw, uh, at different times, uh, the West broadly penetrating into uh, the, the greater Middle East, uh, French and then British in Egypt, uh, uh, Italians and French in North Africa, uh, uh, the French and the British in, um, in the Levant uh, and in Iraq, uh, and on the Eastern Front, uh, of course, the, uh, the, the British history in the subcontinent and in Afghanistan, the wars of 1840 and 1860 uh, in Afghanistan, for example. Um, so as one looks at, again, this broad sweep um, of the world, it is, um, it is highly noteworthy um, uh, to point out that with the exception uh, of central Saudi Arabia, um, the Najd, um, virtually this entire area that I am discussing um, has been occupied uh, by someone else's army at least once. Uh, uh, we, we tend not to track this very well as Americans. That's where our uh, ahistorical nature comes in. We don't like to be concerned with what happened yesterday overly much. Uh, it's all about today and tomorrow. Uh, but the region remembers. Uh, and that is a context that I think is, um, is very important for understanding uh, where we are quite literally today and what the dynamics are uh, that, uh, that shape uh, our presence, um, our engagement, and reactions to it. Um, I, I would suggest that uh, this history, this past, uh, this engagement uh, has had a fundamental impact in shaping Middle Eastern political culture. Um, the peoples of the Middle East learned a long time ago, um, I think, that you really can't keep the big guys out. Um, uh, whether it's the British, the French, the Russians, or the Americans, um, um, their large and modern forces um, uh, cannot be stopped in open battle. Um, I, I think that's led to the, uh, uh, the politics of the counterpunch, uh, reactive politics. Um, if you can't keep them out, accept the inevitable, then close up on them once they're in, uh, 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 start in on the ribs and see how much pain uh, they're gonna be likely to take. 
Uh, again, I, I think you see a, a consistent pattern of this uh, over time in the region. Uh, what it means, uh, combined, I think, with the uh, American tendency towards impatience, uh, is that our adversaries uh, have not even organized for the long fight by the time we're declaring victory and um, figuring out how we want to redeploy. Um, uh, we uh, <clears throat> uh, have seen this, uh, we saw this in Iraq, I think we're seeing it in Afghanistan, um, uh, and I would suggest again that it is born out of historical patterns, uh, historical uh, experience. So again, um, uh, we do very well to uh, attempt to understand the history of the region, to understand that uh, our actions, our policies, uh, however we may believe they're motivated, are seen uh, in often very different terms in this region um, uh, and with different consequences uh, uh, as a result. So that's a sense, uh, very briefly, of, of, of some of the uh, regional dynamics. I'll talk uh, also briefly uh, about the different parts of this region, particularly those that are capturing the headlines now for us, uh, 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 Iraq, Iran, uh, Afghanistan, uh, Pakistan. In, in these initial remarks, I am not going to uh, talk about the Arab-Israeli dimension, not that it isn't important, uh, but, uh, but time is finite, and I uh, would be happy to get um, uh, uh, into that in, in questions. I'm also drawing, of course, from my, my own particularly recent experience, uh, which has been uh, in the areas I describe and not focused uh, directly on the, um, uh, the Arab-Israeli peace process. Uh, in Iraq, um, I think, again, we see historical forces at work, uh, we see the multitude of complexities of the region and of this particular country in the region come into play. Um, and here is one of the lessons uh, that I have learned in this long war. Um, uh, be very, very slow and cautious in commitments, uh, particularly military commitments. In the case of Iraq, uh, and I was involved in the run-up to the war, and I was there immediately after um, uh, the uh, military intervention, it wasn't so much that the planning was inadequate, it certainly was, uh, um, uh, but it was the fact that by undertaking an operation of such magnitude, uh, we were entering a huge, dark, cavern that no amount of prior planning could conceivably have illuminated. I have spoken in other contexts not just to the third and fourth and fifth order consequences that result from uh, an action such as this, but the 20th and 25th order consequences. Uh, things that cannot be planned for, cannot even be foreseen, um, uh, but which one should have the very uncomfortable feeling are going to be out there somewhere along the line. And again, I, I suggest to you that it is a long line. Um, we, um, we may be just thoroughly tired of Iraq. Uh, we have moved it from the front pages back to the want ads. Uh, uh, <clears throat> but in terms of the forces set in motion in 2003, uh, we're still in chapter one um, of what is going to be a very long story of the development of the new Iraq. Uh, and, and that would take me to a second uh, uh, lesson from a long war, that if we need to be slow and cautious in our commitments, um, uh, as certain as we can possibly be, uh, that the risks, including all those risks we can't even really foresee, um, uh, are worth the, um, 
the imperative that is driving us toward this action. If that is all the case, and I think it is, we should be even more cautious and move more slowly to uncommit. Once you're in, you're in. Um, that the process of disengagement uh, uh, may very well uh, lead to the empowerment of forces that are even more dangerous, more inimical to our long-term interests than those we may be confronting through our engagement. Um, so slow to get in, slower yet to disengage. Um, uh, I think in the case of Iraq, and I again will not review the uh, tumultuous narrative of, uh, of the last few years, um, uh, we are seeing things track in a reasonable direction. Um, uh, the surge made a difference. Um, uh, timing in politics and in life is often, um, if not the only thing, it's everything, and I think the timing was quite right. Uh, uh, the Iraqis ha had been through the, uh, the horrors of the sectarian conflict, uh, a, a conflict that is not part of the fabric of Iraqi society or history. Sectarianism uh, uh, very much is, but sectarian violence is not. And I think uh, the surge coincided with, uh, uh, if you will, uh, a certain popular revulsion. It said, this is not the way we want to go. This is not what we want to be. Um, and indeed, we saw something of a virtuous cycle uh, beginning mid-2007 replace the vicious cycle of the, uh, the, the, the preceding 18 months, uh, where uh, the surge the new mission of population security, um, uh, the tamping down of sectarian violence caused Iraqis to uh, reassess themselves and their views of themselves and each other. Um, I, I think we saw uh, uh, Iraqi, Arab, Sunnis, and Shia become less Sunni and less Shia in their identity and more Arab. Uh, uh, it was uh, that process, uh, I think, that gave Prime Minister Maliki the, uh, the political environment he needed to undertake his campaigns against Jaysh al-Mahdi and its allies, uh, the Iranian-backed Shia militias, in, um, in Basra, in other parts of southern Iraq, and in Baghdad in the uh, spring of 2008. Uh, he did so with the knowledge um, that this action would be uh, quite popular uh, among the Iraqi public, popular among the Shia, uh, as much as it was amongst the Sunnis, uh, who saw, again, a, a national force uh, moving to take a pernicious militia off the streets. Um, um, now, again, I don't mean to imply that uh, Iraq now transforms into a sun-dappled upland um, that forever or after is going to be the beacon of hope, enlightenment, and democracy in the Middle East. Uh, this is, as I said, the early pages of a very long story in Iraq. Uh, but I do see grounds uh, for some real encouragement. Um, uh, we are now in an era of a second round of elections. Um, the second round of provincial elections occurred, of course, at the end of January. And for the first time, we saw incumbents lose in Iraq and have to leave office. Um, uh, they moaned and complained and whined and cried foul, but they did. They accepted the results. Uh, we're now preparing for national elections uh, mid-January of 2010. Uh, and if there is one single issue to keep an eye on as you try to chart how Iraq is moving, I'd say, would be those elections. Um, uh, we will expect from Prime Minister Maliki uh, his formal announcement tomorrow that he is entering these elections uh, uh, not associated with, in fact, in opposition to a number of other Shia parties. Uh, and I think this is potentially quite significant, uh, uh, that the, the 
completely sectarian, ethno-sectarian basis of Iraqi politics um, is now becoming somewhat more fluid. Uh, so that Shia coalitions will be pitted against each other uh, in the national elections as they were in provincial elections. We are also seeing now cross-sectarian political alliances. Uh, uh, Prime Minister Maliki is working to bring Sunnis into his coalition. Um, a, another coalition has already emerged between the, uh, the Shia Minister of Interior on the one hand and uh, leaders of the Sunni awakening movement uh, on the other. So um, we'll, we'll see where it tracks, but I, again, I'm seeing some positive fluidity in Iraqi politics. That's the good news. Um, the not so good news, again, is um, the length and difficulty of the story that remains in front of the Iraqis uh, and ourselves. Uh, if sectarian tension has subsided, we are now seeing an increase in ethnic tension. Uh, between Kurds and Arabs, Sunni and Shia together. Uh, uh, thus far, all parties uh, have avoided extensive violence, uh, and I hope they have the, the wisdom and the judgment to continue to do so. Uh, what that new tension underscores, again, is the uh, unfinished business in front of Iraq and Iraqis and Iraq's international supporters. Uh, the nature of state and society is mapped out to an extent through the new constitution and new institutions, um, but not yet in practical terms. So there is a considerable debate raging over the prerogatives, responsibilities, and authorities of the federal government in Baghdad versus the regional government in Kurdistan versus the provincial governments throughout the country. Uh, uh, it is an argument in many respects uh, reminiscent of our own states' rights debates in the uh, early decades of our republic, and of course we all remember um, uh, what it took to resolve those issues, the bloodiest conflict in our history, um, and indeed those issues are not yet fully resolved. Um, so I, I hope the Iraqis are able to proceed with greater expedition uh, and less violence uh, than that which marked our own history, but these are difficult issues. Uh, you don't wave a wand over them. Um, you don't come up with a formula made in Washington that you lay over a complex culture. It has to be worked through uh, in its own terms. Uh, Iraq is difficult enough uh, in its own right, um, but it exists in a highly difficult region, um, which I'll discuss in just a moment. Uh, but first, a word about the U.S.-Iraqi relationship. Um, uh, at the end of 2008, we negotiated two agreements, one on security, another on the broader uh, uh, non-security relationship, and something very interesting happened. Um, when those agreements were concluded and went into effect on January 1st of this year, uh, the debate over U.S. force presence in Iraq was effectively taken off the table in both countries. Um, uh, those in Iraq who had been asserting that the United States was uh, uh, the neo-imperialist uh, colonialist empire uh, suddenly were looking at a document that made it clear that all U.S. forces would be out of Iraq by the end of 2011. Uh, and in this country, you, you saw Iraq, you know, literally move off the front pages, except when there is a horrific car bombing, um, uh, and fade from national debate. Uh, uh, General Petraeus and I, and then subsequently General Odierno and I, knew all along that uh, you were never going to move from bad news in Iraq to good news, um, but we figured if we could go from bad news to no news, uh, it, it, we would be just fine, and increasingly Iraq is no news even though we have 125,000 troops uh, still in that country. Uh, the Strategic Framework Agreement, um, and I, I note these agreements uh, in large part because I was the chief negotiator, so they, uh, they really do constitute the uh, finest achievement uh, uh, on paper since the New Testament. Um, uh, but they 
contain, particularly the strategic framework agreement, the, the potential architecture um, for a fundamentally different relationship between Iraq uh, and not just the United States, but the West generally. Um, uh, since the 1958 revolution, Iraq has existed in an adversarial relationship uh, with the countries around it and with the West generally. Uh, it didn't start with Saddam. It, it, it began as, uh, after the overthrow of the monarchy in 1958. Uh, this agreement uh, and the virtually universal uh, view among Iraq's political leaders that the, uh, the long-term stability and prosperity of the country lies in association with the West uh, could fundamentally change that. Uh, we see, for example, the commitment of the Prime Minister to send up to 10,000 young Iraqis a year abroad on government scholarships for higher education. Uh, uh, we would like to see a substantial number of these come to the United States, uh, a country in which young Iraqis, by and large, have been excluded, largely by their own government, again, for most of a half of a century. Uh, uh, economic relations, there will be a conference in October sponsored by the U.S. Uh, and Iraqi governments on a trade and investment in Iraq, uh, uh, unthinkable after 1958. Um, we encourage similar engagement with Europe. Uh, so I think we have at least the prospect in front of us of uh, uh, an Iraq that is able to ensure its own macro stability um, and that has a fundament fundamentally different direction vis-a-vis uh, -vis the West. Uh, it is certainly worth uh, our continued engagement, which will increasingly be not in military terms, but through the other instruments uh, of power in cooperation with the Iraqis themselves. Uh, again, as I said, Iraq does not exist in isolation. Uh, uh, it's part of a pretty tough neighborhood, and indeed a neighborhood that it contributed to making tough um, for so many years. Um, uh, Turkey and the Arabs of the peninsula um, form what you could call a north-south axis uh, as, as you look at the map. Um, Iraq's relations with Turkey have substantially expanded over the course of the past year, uh, both between Turkey and the federal government in Baghdad, but at least as important between Turkey and uh, the Kurdish regional government in the north. Uh, uh, if this trend continues, I think having an Iraqi state and a Kurdish region uh, in close relationship with Turkey uh, helps cement the, uh, the possibilities I earlier described of an association with the West. Uh, Turkey is a founding member of NATO my own view is it should have been some time ago a member of the European Union, but that is a matter for another debate. Um, it is a significant potential development. Uh, I worked during my time in Iraq uh, with uh, varying degrees of success to, to encourage Iraq's Arab neighbors uh, to step up their positive engagement um, uh, with the new Iraqi government. Um, uh, when I arrived in Iraq, we had zero Arab ambassadors. Um, uh, when I left, there were five. Um, and I, I put it in those terms so uh, you will subconsciously give me full credit for uh, uh, something that I only had a little bit to do with. Um, uh, but again, Iraq's history with its neighbors is an extraordinarily difficult one. Um, with its invasions of Iran and then of Kuwait, uh, its efforts at subversion in the Arabian Peninsula in Syria and Jordan. Um, there is an opportunity to reshape those relations, but it will require engagement from both sides. Uh, and there is still considerable reluctance um, among many Arab states. I was encouraged to see last week that uh, in New York, Secretary Clinton uh, continued with the practice of meetings of the Gulf Cooperation Council states, the six, plus three. The plus three are Egypt, Jordan, and Iraq. So I think the, the formalized dialogue from the Gulf uh, 
states uh, with Iraq uh, is, again, uh, an encouraging trend, something that we need to, to support um, in ways that facilitate its development. Um, Iraq's two most problematic neighbors are Iran and Syria. Uh, and here again, it's important to, to understand history, recent as well as not so recent, and to understand how the region looks at us, uh, our adversaries as well as our allies. Uh, there is a strategic alliance, of course, between Iran and Syria that uh, began developing immediately after the Islamic Revolution. Uh, uh, and was solidly forged in the wake of the 1982 Israeli invasion of Lebanon, uh, when Iran and Syria collaborated on the formation of Hezbollah uh, uh, and used that against us and against the Israelis uh, in the years that followed. Um, and I, I would suggest to you that Iran and Syria uh, learned a lesson during that period, um, and that lesson was the broader historical point I made at the outset. Um, get in close, start counterpunching, and see how much pain they'll take before they go home. Um, well, we went home in 1984 from Lebanon. Uh, uh, the Israelis lasted a lot longer. They didn't go home until 2000, but they went home. Uh, my, my own judgment is that uh, uh, Damascus and Tehran, who have kept that relationship absolutely solid in the intervening years, um, were seeing Iraq in the same context um, by 2006. Uh, Syria was facilitating al-Qaeda and uh, Ba'athi remnant activities staged out of Syria. Iran, of course, was supporting uh, Jaysh al-Mahdi uh, and other militias in attacks on us as well as the Iraqi government. And I, I, I think they thought they could replicate the Lebanon experience. Again, same countries, same alliance, same tactics in many respects. That is, in my view, another element of the importance of the surge. Uh, we, we didn't run to form as far as the Iranians and Syrians were concerned. Uh, as the pain increased, we did not step back, we stepped forward. Uh, and I think the Iranians in particular are still trying to sort out uh, uh, what this means for their interests and their options. Um, uh, you all know the differences between Iran and Iraq. Uh, some of our friends in the Gulf states talk of the specter of Iranian dominion over Iraq because, after all, the Shia are now in ascendancy and all Shia are basically Persian, so the Iranians win. Um, uh, I don't know whether they really believe that. It is uh, absolutely untrue. Uh, Iraqi Shia died by the hundreds of thousands um, in the 1980-88 war. Uh, defending their sense of an Iraqi and an Arab state against a Persian enemy. Um, I, I note this uh, just in passing to, to say that Iranian influence uh, in Iraq is, is almost self-limiting. Um, the political parties associated uh, with Iran did very poorly in the provincial elections, uh, and that was part of the reason. Um, um, but Iran can still create considerable mischief, um, and it is something that we and the Iraqis have to be um, on watch for. A final word on Iraq, uh, uh, and this also goes back to the importance of history, is the persistence of political culture. Regimes may change. Uh, political cultures and societies change much more slowly if they change at all. Um, and we are seeing this internally in Iraq, where, in my judgment, uh, Prime Minister al-Maliki, uh, uh, in many respects, is resembling previous Iraqi leaders. Uh, uh, not Saddam Hussein, certainly, as his political adversaries uh, assert, but um, uh, not totally unlike Abdul Karim Qasim, the, um, uh, the first post-revolutionary leader of Iraq, who. Uh, established himself as a strong man, um, uh, using 
uh, violence against some adversaries, patronage against other groups, constantly shifting and maneuvering. Uh, there is a lot of that going on in Iraq now. Uh, and uh, again, to understand Iraq's present, to get some sense of what Iraq's future might be, some sense, uh, it's important to look at Iraq's historical past. Uh, uh, Iran, uh, very much, of course, the subject of concern uh, uh, now for the United States and the West uh, generally. Uh, we are looking tomorrow to the um, first meeting of the P5 plus one, uh, uh, five permanent members of the Security Council and uh, Germany sitting down in Geneva with the Iranians. Uh, this was done under the Bush administration, but this is the first formal engagement uh, 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 at this time. Uh, and the qu overarching question of what to do about Iran's um, uh, nuclear quest. Uh, here again, I, I think it's important to uh, look at Iran from an historical perspective. Um, uh, Iran has always seen itself as a great regional power. Uh, certainly since the time of the Safavid Empire, uh, where incidentally Iraq was the, uh, the point of confrontation between Safavids and Ottoman. Um, back to the Sasanians, arguably. Uh, uh, and as a self-perceived great power, uh, Iraq has traditionally sought to project power beyond its borders. Uh, the Shah did this with conventional forces. Uh, the uh, uh, Iranian navy under the Shah uh, uh, turned the Gulf into what he styled as a Persian lake. Uh, he deployed ground forces into the Arabian Peninsula to assist the Omani government defeat a communist-backed insurgency, insurgency in western uh, Oman. Um, undoubtedly, the Omanis were grateful for the help, but the Shah's real purpose was demonstrating to the region uh, that he had the capability uh, to use Iranian force outside of Iran's borders. Uh, the Islamic Republic does the same thing. Uh, it uses different means. Uh, 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 Hezbollah is an instrument of Iranian power projection, uh, as was Jaysh al Mahdi, uh, 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 as is, in a slightly different fashion, uh, elements of Hamas and the Palestine Islamic Jihad, um, who are all coordinated by a single element in Iran, and that is the, uh, the Quds Force. Uh, so again, a dramatic change of regimes in Iran, but I, I would suggest to you a persistence of um, uh, geostrategic interests uh, uh, and the means of pursuing them. Again, this should not come as a surprise to us, um, but uh, it often gets lost in the debate. Uh, why is that important here? Uh, uh, my view is that it doesn't matter who rules in Tehran. Uh, uh, Iran will have an interest in a nuclear weapons capability. It is consistent with its uh, self-view as a regional superpower. Um, it is in a region that already has nuclear weapon states. Uh, uh, Pakistan declared, Israel unde undeclared. Uh, uh, this is not just a whim of the Islamic rulers of Tehran. I think this is rooted in uh, uh, Iranian strategic strategy and, and therefore uh, is an even more difficult issue uh, for us to get at. Uh, I don't have answers to this, by the way. I do think it may emerge as uh, a more troubling and profound question for uh, the Obama administration ultimately than either Iraq uh, or Afghanistan over time. Um, uh, I'd um, plan to say a great deal about um, um, Afghanistan and Pakistan, uh, but because I've droned on this long already, and most particularly because Ambassador Finn is sitting right in front of me, um, uh, I will uh, uh, try not to make an egregious fool out of myself uh, uh, over Afghanistan. 
um, um, except to say that I think some of the broader issues I've tried to lay out very much come into play here. Um, uh, uh, the need for consistency, um, the need for strategic patience, um, the need uh, to show and demonstrate continuity. Um, there is a lot of focus on both Afghanistan and Pakistan now. I was um, in Washington about 10 days ago to testify in front of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, particularly about um, uh, Pakistan and the Pakistan-Afghan nexus and relationship. Uh, and it reminded me all too uncomfortably of other times I have sat in front of the Senate and the House with General Petraeus in 2007, 2008, uh, to hear a barrage of questions and criticism about uh, uh, our presence and our commitment in Iraq. Uh, you just substitute Afghanistan for Iraq and you're hearing much of the, uh, the same debate. Uh, um, I do not know nearly enough about Afghanistan to pontificate before you on what I think our strategy should be. Um, I do think we need a strategy of sustained commitment I think we do have people on the ground, uh, uh, General McChrystal, uh, Ambassador Eikenberry with long experience in Afghanistan, um, the commander of Central Command, my old Baghdad comrade and current friend, uh, General Petraeus, uh, uh, certainly knows lessons from the Iraq war that could be usefully applied in Afghanistan. Uh, I hope the administration will listen carefully and I hope they will move quickly. Uh, because my sense is that the current debate and the uncertainty it generates uh, is uh, uh, causing to happen again what has happened many times in the past in this region, our adversaries to be encouraged uh, that a little more pressure and a little more pain, the Americans will go home, and for our allies to be equally or doubly concerned that that is exactly what will happen. And this is true uh, doubly so in the case of Pakistan. Um, I applaud the administration for its focus on Pakistan, on a substantial and sustained relationship there. Uh, there is no major country with which we have had a more uneven relationship than with Pakistan. The close embrace in the 60s, the distance in the 70s, the even closer embrace in the 80s to confront the Soviet uh, invasion of Afghanistan, the deep estrangement of the 90s when uh, Pakistan went almost overnight from being the most allied of allies to the most sanctioned of adversaries over a nuclear program that we had known about for the previous 15 years. Um, so the Pakistanis are glad we're back um, after 9-11, uh, asking themselves how long is it for this time? and. Uh, uh, I can tell you that um, from my own experience in Pakistan, uh, there is no way that a Pakistan-specific strategy and uh, commitment is going to work to the benefit of either country if we decide we'll just let Afghanistan go. Uh, can't be done. The, uh, uh, the British have a lot to answer for, uh, whether it's uh, Kashmir or Palestine or Iraq. Um, or the, the Durand line, uh, which is uh, the ultimate non-border uh, between uh, Pakistan and Iraq. But uh, what happens in Afghanistan does not stay in Afghanistan, uh, and what happens in Pakistan does not stay in Pakistan. Uh, and uh, a total spiral to violence uh, within Afghanistan would have the most grievous consequences, I would suggest, uh, on the other side of the border. Um, I, I said that would uh, uh, be where I would end it, but um, I, I'd like to come back to Iran for just a moment. Um, the question of to talk to Iran or not to talk to Iran, uh, we are talking to Iran in the P5 plus one context. Uh, I had two sustained intervals of direct discussion with the Iranians um, uh, the first on Afghanistan, and that ran for 18 months, actually, uh, right after 9-11 up until the beginning of May 2003. Uh, I also had um, 
face-to-face uh, -face talks with my Iranian counterpart in, um, uh, in Baghdad. They could not have been more different experiences. The um, uh, negotiation with the Iranians over Afghanistan, it was not a clandestine process, but it was a discreet one. Um, uh, the press never showed a lot of interest in it, which was absolutely wonderful. Um, and we did a lot of serious business. Uh, the Iranians were fully supportive of our military intervention, impatient for it to get underway in Afghanistan, gave us the benefit of their thinking on uh, 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 Taliban's point of strength and so forth. Um, uh, and the Bonn Conference, of course, uh, that produced the Afghan interim administration was sponsored by the United Nations, but the core of those agreements lay in consensus between Iran and the United States on how to proceed. Um, uh, I, I was in Kabul um, uh, in periodic discussions with my uh, Afghan colleague who had been my interlocutor since 9-11. Uh, since uh, I was there when the Axis of Evil State of the Union address was delivered. Uh, that was not the best morning of my professional career. Uh, um, but we sustained the effort uh, on through until the spring of, um, of 03. Um, and, and I have a few thoughts about talking to the Iranians. First, well, yes, we should talk to the Iranians. Um, uh, uh, there is no country more complex in the Middle East than Iran, and there is no country about which we know less. Um, uh, so, you know, learning starts when you're actually talking to the other guy. Let's, let's see where it goes. It's also an opportunity to see what may be possible. It may be an opportunity to influence or at least uh, screw with their minds and sow confusion. Um, uh, but, but here I... Um, question to some degree the utility of the P5 plus one process. Um, uh, it will take place in the full glare of publicity. Um, everybody will hold press conferences when the talks conclude. Um, indeed, they're already holding press conferences before the talks even began, if you saw the interview with the Iranian foreign minister. Uh, and um, I, I would take some exception to the wisdom uh, of a great Princetonian uh, uh, whose name graces this school. Uh, um, I firmly support open covenants, uh, but I strongly believe they need to be secretly arrived at. Uh, uh, the process of negotiation does not lend itself well to being done in the full light of publicity. Um, we could not have done what we did uh, with the Iranians on Afghanistan if we had to go out and hold a press conference after each session. That is what we did in Iraq. Um, uh, and uh, again, I've been involved in a number of singularly frustrating and unproductive activities in my long uh, checkered career. I'd have trouble thinking of anything more unproductive than the, uh, uh, the interminable hours we spent uh, uh, talking about uh, absolutely nothing worthwhile with the Iranians during that phase in Iraq. And part of it, again, was because it was all basically a public negotiation. There are other more complex regions. So, um, I hope we can uh, uh, develop and sustain a dialogue with Iran. Um, I think we are going to need a different mechanism uh, at some point than the, um, than the P5 plus one. And with that, I would be um, pleased to take your questions. A few interesting issues raised that might um, prompt a few questions. Uh, if you have questions, you know the drill, please come down to the microphones. Um, state your name and some affiliation. And uh, when you do pose your question, please pose it as a question, um, not as a countervailing, equally long speech. Uh, we will talk to Patty and have you booked uh, here if you really feel you need equal time. So, um, for questions, please, I do invite you to come down. A uh, number of very challenging issues were raised. 
I know it's a little bit hard. It kind of takes a little while to get this part of it started. Uh, otherwise, I'm just going to go on with yeah. the modern history of the Middle East. And yeah. Believe me, you don't you, want that. You're going to go back to the Safavid and all those guys. You really don't want to hear that. Go ahead, please. Uh, uh, hello, sir. My name is James Head. I'm a I'm in the I'm in the Navy. I'm a lieutenant in the Navy. Um, I, uh, I think you're a great, great public servant, sir. I, I admit I, I would feel a little better if you were somewhere on that map right now. <laughs> my, my question is uh, about, since you talked about the use of history and how important you thought it was, um, I've done a little reading recently about the strategic agreement or the treaty that the British negotiated at the end of the mandate. Uh, and I, what I wanted to know was how much of that historical experience and, and sort of the animosity that the Iraqis later had for it, how much of that informed your own negotiations for, for, you, for you yourself as well as your, your counterparts in the Iraqi government? Uh, that, that's a great question, and the reference is to the, um, the 1948 Treaty of Portsmouth between um, uh, Iraq and the United Kingdom. Uh, yes, believe me, I was very mindful of the um, of that agreement, of its substance, and particularly the Iraqi reaction to it. Um, if I was mindful of it, I can tell you that Prime Minister Nouri al-Maliki was even more mindful because the controversy over the agreement um, led to the downfall of Iraq's first Shia Prime Minister. Um, um, and Prime Minister Maliki was quite determined uh, that uh, uh, an agreement with the Neo-Britain not be one that would lead to his downfall. Um, and the irony, of course, is that the whole Portsmouth exercise was designed to um, produce a basis for a relationship on more even terms than the agreements of the 1930s. Um, um, but by, by the time of Portsmouth, uh, Iraqi nationalist sent sentiment um, uh, and anger over uh, the perception of British tutelage had reached the point that uh, uh, that agreement, better for Iraq certainly than the 1930s agreements, uh, was never going to meet the public test. Um, and, uh, you know, it's uh, in the benefits of, of language, and I cannot overemphasize that. Uh, um, the fact that at different times, in the negotiations, the Prime Minister and I could just go off together, the two of us, no note takers, no translators, no staffs, and um, kind of zero base where we were, where the problems were, and think through how we could get around them, um, uh, certainly helped the process. And we developed kind of a shorthand where he'd kind of look at me and he'd say, Portsmouth. <laughs> um, uh, and you know, again, any negotiation is a two-front war. Um, you're negotiating uh, with your foreign partner, and you're also negotiating with your own government. Uh, and, and one of the particular challenges I had was explaining why, if we stuck on this point or that, um, why we wouldn't get it, and why, if we did get it, we would later regret it because, it, uh, you know, the Iraqi agreements had to be taken to Parliament, uh, um, uh, that we would risk um, the stability of the government we were trying to support. So um, I was uh, uh, glad that I had studied enough about the Treaty of Portsmouth to know what was out there, and I am um, even happier that, so far, knock on wood, uh, the reaction to the uh, agreements we negotiated in 2008 um, has not been that which greeted uh, Portsmouth. Bill Parsons, uh, captain in the Army in the Woodrow Wilson School, second year. Um, just a question about democracy promotion. Under the last administration, of course, democracy promotion was a huge priority, but it seems that it's, it doesn't have quite the same prominence now. What, uh, and, and many assert that in the Middle East, democracy promotion maybe is ineffective. Could you just give your response to that criticism? Well, it's a, it's a great question, and it's a great question in America. Uh, kind of gets at the root of who we are. Um, we're, we're different than most countries. We're founded on principles. It's what is called often American exceptionalism. Uh, 
our, our principles are universal. Um, so it, it, it causes to, to tend toward the belief that if, if, if these are good principles in this country and if they are universally good principles, um, uh, isn't it actually something of our duty to ensure that the rest of the world enjoys them? Um, uh, and, you know, again, it's a, it's a noble thought um, that then meets the harsh reality uh, of the rest of the world um, uh, where conditions may not admit to um, those kinds of principles and may not uh, be at all welcomed by the people they are intended to help. Um, uh, that doesn't mean that um, uh, we should not uh, work to promote and strengthen democracy. I think some of our most effective assistance programs are in the field of legislative strengthening. I, I was a strong supporter of that program in, um, in Pakistan where we signed a memoranda of understanding with the four provincial assemblies as well as the national bodies as to, to how we would organize assistance to them uh, to uh, strengthen their legislative capacities. But the key here is, of course, it's their system, their bodies, um, and they set the agenda, what they wanted us to do, what they didn't want us to do. I think there is scope for that in Iraq. I know there is, because one of the more encouraging things I saw there was the, uh, the development of the Iraqi parliament into um, a functioning institution. Um, uh, and the, the growth of individual legislators um, uh, into, um, into effective politicians. So I think we have a role in strengthening those sorts of institutions where they are clearly rooted uh, in, uh, in the society of the country and supported by them. Um, uh, but to, to try to uh, export our version of democracy, um, you know, be democratic or die, uh, I, I, I don't think is, um, is highly effective. Again, it's a great principle. Um, but uh, uh, if not carefully managed, uh, uh, it becomes not an issue of sharing aspirations, but an expression of American arrogance, at least as it's perceived abroad, and, and highly counterproductive. Hello, I'm Joanna Nathan, MPP. My question is actually exactly the opposite. Um, my question um, looks at a lot of sloganeering was had about promoting mm -hmm. democracy, whereas actually the American policy, certainly in Pakistan, was to support a military regime um, which was in alliance with extremist parties who had never received more than 10% of the vote at the uh, ballot box. That, I mean, when you, you described Iran um, as, uh, in its support of proxies as instruments of, of foreign policy, and I mean, I immediately, my thoughts then turned to Pakistan, that, you, that the elements supported there, you know, the, the vast bulk of, of $11 billion was directed towards um, supporting a, a military and security um, uh, authorities there who support radical jihadists who work across the region against American interests. Um, so mm -hmm. I, I'm just curious if you think there should have been more of a fundamental realignment of, of interests towards Afghanistan and trying to realign its uh, strategic interests in the long term um, before this, this re-engagement post-2001. Yeah, again, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a regionalist. I'm not a theorist. Uh, I'm sure that will bring the ceiling of this great hall down on me. Uh, um, and I am inclined to deal with the region in its own terms, at least as I perceive them, um, uh, and to try to be sure that while understanding our own interests, I also understand to the best that I can um, what the view is from that particular country. And again, history counts. The, the Pakistani narrative, of course, uh, runs in a different direction. Um, um, that they were first done over by the British and partition, um, um, and were left with uh, few options in trying to develop a viable state, uh, except to fight for what was rightfully theirs, that would be Kashmir. Um, and they did so through an Islamic idiom, being the um, uh, the homeland for South Asia's Muslims, never mind that there were more Muslims uh, in what became India than were in Pakistan, that, that was the narrative. Um, if you transpose that to uh, Afghanistan, um, 
and I had many diverting hours with Pakistanis, uh, military and civilian, being told the, uh, uh, the multitude of failings of omission and commission by the United States. Uh, uh, after uh, 1989, uh, uh, that left them with uh, total chaos on their western uh, borders, uh, that left them uh, with reduced means to be able to uh, uh, to deal with these influences because we had just totally sanctioned them military and, militarily and economically. Um, and did they cut a deal with the Taliban? You bet they did. Uh, and uh, as many of them said, they'd do it again if the circumstances were the same. Uh, because of the inconsistency in the relationship, and this again, this is the Pakistani narrative. I'm not saying it is correct, but it is their narrative. Um, uh, the, the more forthright among them will say, yeah, we're still hedging our bets um, because you may be gone again the day after tomorrow and we're still going to be here. And um, how many existential enemies do we really want to have um, for your sake that we then may have to deal with alone? Um, so that's, uh, you know, there, there are a lot of ways you can debate this, but where I come out is um, we need to make the strategic decision for a long-term commitment in Pakistan uh, that needs to be uh, uh, more about helping the Pakistanis do things in their country that are not security related, health, education, development of democratic institutions, um, but to signal that we're there for the long haul. Uh, my sense of Pakistan, its leadership and its population uh, is that it does not desire to become the next Islamic Emirate. As you rightly point out, the uh, Islamist parties uh, routinely net somewhere around 10% of the vote. They, they do not have broad popular support. Uh, but again, you know a great deal about Pakistani politics uh, and, shall we say, the uh, extreme flexibility of, of, of politicians so that we see Islamists in alliance uh, one day with um, um, the Musharraf party at the time, and the next day they're uh, working with the PPP against Musharraf, and then it all slides back and forth. It's, it redefines the concept of opportunism. Um, but again, I think as both a, um, a popular issue and an establishment issue, uh, uh, the current leadership in Pakistan and the past, after Zia al-Haq, military and civilian, and the people uh, below them, uh, do not want to see a Pakistan that looks like the Taliban. My name is Ojan Yazdani. I am a Master of Public Affairs uh, first year student. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, you talked about the, or you highlighted the role that publicity played in, in successful negotiations uh, with Iran at the Bonn Agreement, and then also uh, unsuccessful negotiations with Iran in Iraq. Um, one of the questions I had was, to what extent do you see the, the differing administrations and, in Iran and political environments in Iran as having, to do, having something to do with that uh, with regard to the more unsuccessful negotiations in Iran? Yeah, and that's, uh, I'm glad you asked the question because I, I didn't want to eat up more time amplifying what could have been a misleading comment. Uh, um, uh, I think the public glare on the Baghdad talks uh, were part of the reason they um, didn't go anywhere. But, but there were other, perhaps uh, far more central reasons. Um, uh, by the time we sat down um, uh, uh, with the Iranians in Iraq, uh, the atmosphere on both sides of looking for common ground that, um, that dominated our conversations on Afghanistan, that had totally dissipated. Um, uh, they, you know, we broke those talks off with them in May of 2003 because Al-Qaeda elements of whom the Iranians were aware present in Iran uh, uh, had a direct operational role in the bombings in Saudi Arabia that killed Americans. Uh, and it didn't get better after that. Um, uh, the Iranians really saw no interest whatsoever um, in accommodating us in any way. 
uh, whether it was um, uh, uh, on Afghanistan or, uh, or Iraq. And it was kind of interesting. We, uh, we had the rounds in 07. Um, we talked about having talks uh, through late 07 and early 08. And remember, the focus here was security in Iraq. Um, and it was uh, Nouri al-Maliki who in, um, in March of 2008 said, uh, enough about talks, uh, uh, we're going to fight. And so instead of talking about how Iranian support for Jaysh al-Mahdi needed to be uh, significantly diminished, uh, uh, Prime Minister al-Maliki just went after him uh, militarily and there was no more talk about talks. Uh, now what kind of atmosphere do we have now? Uh, you know, I, uh, I don't know. I cannot say I'm in any way uh, overly encouraged. Uh, but I, I do think if we're going to test whether there are issues uh, on which we can engage with the Iranians, uh, we're going to need to find a way to explore that more quietly than the Geneva Forum is, is, uh, is going to permit. Good evening, sir. I'm Seth Lynn, a second year MPA student. And my question is about the role of non-military forces in Iraq, and there's been a criticism that there wasn't enough State Department or other non-military uh, people helping. Um, and would you agree with that? And if so, uh, what else would you, would you change, and would you apply it to anything in Afghanistan? The, um, of course, uh, the State Department, the Foreign Service, and the military services are uh, fundamentally different, not least in size. Um, um, uh, Iraq is and uh, remains um, uh, the largest foreign service presence anywhere in the world, um, uh, but we are an extremely small service. Uh, thanks to the previous administration and the current administration, we are seeing our resources and hence our numbers increase. Uh, uh, but uh, America doesn't uh, doesn't want or need a foreign service, again, that is measured in battalions. Um, uh, we do play an essential coordinating role. Uh, we saw to it that every provincial reconstruction team in Iraq, and at the height there were 29 of them, uh, was headed by a foreign service officer with a staff under him or her that was largely non-foreign service. But because that's what we do professionally, we coordinate efforts of other agencies, that's what made a lot of sense. Um, what I think we have not done, uh, we did not do during my time there, it drove me crazy, we're still not doing, is we have not developed um, a civilian mobilization mechanism. Because again, the, the Foreign Service um, does not have the skill sets that uh, go with contingency operations. Uh, we have a very limited number of lawyers. And I will refrain from making the lawyer jokes that come to the tip of my tongue. Um, we don't have public health specialists. Uh, USAID used to have these skills, but they have been hollowed out over the years. There uh, were far more USAID officers deployed in Vietnam than exist in the, the entire global USAID operation today. So they haven't got them either. Um, uh, and there is no mechanism to, to reach out and mobilize those skill sets. Uh, we talk about having a civilian reserve, but we don't have it, except in the very limited uh, world of uh, USAID's disaster assistance response teams that have uh, relationships with uh, public health service and with fire departments and so forth that, that are committed to paper. Uh, I would suggest to we we need this, we need it badly, when I needed more lawyers and public health specialists, I had to get on the phone and plead with the Attorney General for assistant U.S. attorneys coming out of his hide. I had to plead with the Secretary of Health and Human Services uh, for public health specialists, and to their immense credit, uh, they stepped forward. Um, but they had no mandate or mission to, and no coordinating mechanism um, back in Washington to pull all this together. I, I used to lament that in Iraq, uh, not only were we not a nation at war, we weren't even a government at war. Um, uh, the resources, the talents, the skills are there. The Foreign Service is uniquely qualified to uh, 
coordinate and marshal those skills and talents, but we have to have a better way than we do now to get them into the fight. I'm Jessica Morrison, a second year MPA student. Um, I have, I was wondering about um, how you mentioned uh, Nouri al-Maliki and his um, separation uh, to a certain extent from uh, these Iraq, Iraq Supreme Islamic Council and the United Iraqi Alliance that was formed. Um, and it seems like a progressive step. Um, but I'm wondering if you think he has what it takes to be uh, a strong leader um, in the future in Iraq and an independent leader. Uh, well, again, it's, it's, it's interesting um, just looking at the debate over Prime Minister Maliki. Um, um, he emerged as prime minister because no consensus could form on uh, some of the better known and uh, stronger figures uh, as they were then perceived. Uh, it was thought that uh, he would um, uh, make no waves and create no difficulties. Then as uh, violence continued to worsen, he was criticized uh, for being too weak. Um, and now he's being criticized for being too strong. Um, so uh, I, I think he's kind of finding, he's finding his groove here. Um, but uh, first we're gonna have to see how he does in the elections. Uh, he, he is taking, I think, uh, a very bold risk in running against uh, the rest of the Shia alliance, and what an alliance it is. I mean, you've got the Sadrists and the Supreme Islamic Council running on the same ticket. Uh, these are two groups that really spend a lot of time killing each other, and, and may yet again. Um, and that may be part of Maliki's calculation. So how he does in this electoral test is, is going to tell us a lot about um, uh, his strengths and his weaknesses. But I'd, I'd make another, unless I sound too rosy about Iraq, um, bear in mind that if you look at Iraq historically, it is notoriously hard to govern. Um, um, the Iraqis are fond of saying that um, uh, only two men ever did it successfully. Uh, one of them was Hajjaj bin Yusuf, uh, in the dawn of Islam, uh, who did it by the sword um, down in Kufa, and the other was Saddam Hussein. Um, Abdul Karim Qasim, who I mentioned earlier, again, uh, a ruthless, brilliant, politically talented leader um, who did an amazing job of uh, uh, producing coalitions, uh, banging heads, uh, rewarding others, and eventually it just got away from him. Um, uh, Iraq is still very hard to govern. Um, and we see this again uh, in all sorts of ways, not least vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Kurds. So um, I think um, uh, Maliki is developing into a strong leader. Um, whether he is strong enough, of course, we're gonna have to see. Yeah, Mr. Ambassador, my name is Michael Morandi, uh, MPA 1983. Um, sort of a common theme throughout your talk is that you get, it's almost like Obama. Careful, we have to be just as careful getting out as we were getting in. We, we have to be there. We have to be committed. Um, and you take a very historical bent to this, which is, you know, great. You know, like the Pakistans told you, you know, we have to deal with the Taliban, so, you know, don't cut and run, because if you're not here, you know, we're going to continue to have these relationships. My question is, how long are we, you know, re responsible for staying in these countries? What are the implications of military resources? And, you know, where does that take us, really? Uh, well, that's what presidents get to decide. And, of course, that's what this president is embarked on right now in his, uh, uh, his assessment of Afghanistan. Uh, look. These are complicated issues, um, um, but they've got to be addressed in a number of ways. Um, one of them is what you suggest. What's, what does it take to sustain this commitment? What are the resources uh, and for how long? The other, and this is again something that General Petraeus and I tried constantly to keep in front of Congress and public opinion, uh, you have to consider what the alternatives are. Uh, uh, what are the alternative courses of action 
and what are the probable consequences of alternative courses of action. Uh, you know, we got it. People were tired of Iraq. People didn't want to do it anymore. Um, um, but, you know, it, it, it's not like a, a bad movie where you, you can just walk out after the second reel. Uh, it's going to go on with us or without us. Um, it went on in Afghanistan uh, in the 1990s without us. Um, uh, you know, and we got where we got uh, uh, on September 11th. Um, so if, if we don't want to make the commitment, um, then we've got we've to soberly consider what the alternatives are and where they're likely to take us. Uh, I think, again, the focus on Pakistan is right. Um, you know, it's 175 million people. Uh, the Shia in Pakistan constitute 15% of the population only. That means there are more Shia in Pakistan than there are Iraqis in Iraq, Sunni, Shia, and Kurds. Uh, so, you know, do we want to wave them goodbye one more time um, with the forces at work? I mean, it's a triple insurgency, the Kashmiri militants, the, uh, the Afghan militants, and the militancy that is letting off bombs that is fused from the two throughout Lahore, Islamabad, and Peshawar. Um, uh, you know, they're ready to ramp up, um, particularly if we ramp down. And, uh, you know, I'm not trying to say this in a hyperbolic fashion, but we really have to think about these things. Uh, uh, my own judgment coming out of two and a half years in Pakistan is that, as I suggested earlier, we have got an establishment, military and civilian, we have a population um, that wants outcomes in Pakistan very much like what we would like to see, which means I think it is achievable. Uh, but it is going to take, again, a long-term sustained commitment. I think the costs of that, uh, again, over the long run, will be substantially less um, than pursuing courses similar to those we did in 1989-1990, uh, which is just to get out of the area. Okay.